Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back. You're listening to The Blockchain Show. This is episode number 190. Uh, it's been a while, but we're very grateful to welcome him back. Mr. Christian K. Meyer, managing partner at Sustany Capital. Christian, welcome back. Well, thank you for having me again, Ethan. It's been a while indeed, I think. What has it been, two years? Yeah, about. So a lot has happened. Um, and I know we've got a lot of uh, great topics to get into, but uh, maybe for those who haven't caught that last episode, uh, maybe say a little bit about yourself and bring us up to speed. Sure. Yeah, the, the typical nickel tour goes like this. My partner and I have been technology investing for some 20 years at this point in time. The funny accent in my voice originated in Germany. I was a software developer for a brief period of time in the 80s, but then decided that's not for me and went to law school. And when I came out of law school, I was still a technologist at heart. So I joined one of the early internet service providers and we were very lucky to sell that company at the height of the dot com. So I promptly retired from the law in 2000 and then shortly after I moved from Hamburg, where I was living at the time, to Southern California and started one of our first venture funds. And our original focus was on multi-massive online player games and voice of IP solutions, which has a lot to do and a lot in common with the topics that we like to invest in today, which is decentralized software solutions or how most people refer to a blockchain. Um, how do you make a case to investors for uh, venture capital over the other asset classes? Yeah, I mean, we, we take a very scientific approach to things and we are very data driven. So what we did is we analyzed the past 30 years, also obviously for our own sake, right? Because our first fund was entirely comprised of our own funds. We didn't actually allow limited partners into the funds, um, which we're going to change here in the near future. But we literally looked at the past 30 years and saw what different asset classes returned. So if you had put, let's say, 100 bucks into um, treasury bills, you would have returned 2.3 times your money. If you put it in T-notes, you would have returned 6.6 uh, .6 times your money. If you used corporate bonds as an investment vehicle, you would have returned 13x your money. SMPs, which is kind of the benchmark for, for investors, has done really, really well 20 times your money if, um, if you look at this, but what has done exceptionally well was venture capital. So if you look at an index of venture capital specifically for our state here in California, the return was 77 times uh, on 100 bucks you would have put in 30 years ago. And what's important there to notice too, that even though a lot of um, investors will kind of distribute their funds across different asset classes, such as um, the capital markets, obviously being one of the largest one, needless to say. If you analyze the capital markets by themselves, you will see that a large portion of the Fortune 100 right now, so the Apples and Amazons, Googles and Facebook of um, today, they make up 46% of all the value of, of the capital markets at the moment. So what does that tell you? So all of these companies have raised venture capital and they accrued a lot of um, returns in the capital markets. However, what we've seen over the past, specifically the past four years is that companies stay private much longer. That's why you see a lot of unicorns, way more unicorns in the private markets now occur than there have ever been. If you go back even 20 years, there were like four unicorns in the private markets, but uh, now you got 300% uh, growth of those. So what that means is that the upside is being captured in the private markets. I see. And um, I guess this is a kind of a two-part question, but when did you foresee this shift into the blockchain space and why did your fund choose to focus on, on blockchain instead of more traditional focuses? Yeah, I mean, uh, a, lo a lot of reasons, but um, primarily it's it's the largest opportunity out there, right, in, in terms of investment sizes that you can make and the largest technology shift that we have ever seen. It's much larger than the actual internet initially because it's also introducing um, new protocols that weren't possible before, but 
uh, furthermore replacing existing protocols of um, existing paradigms. But then from my personal perspective, I sold my last startup in 2008 and we were trying to kind of build Yelp before Yelp. And so I came to the realization that we never kind of finished actually building the World Wide Web because what you're seeing is pretty much the commercial web, right? So that's what you're getting when you do a Google search, you, you're running a query against the index. So the larger point there being is, so I started writing on a thesis, what it would take to actually decentralize the web. Although I don't think I called it that initially, I don't remember anymore because it's been such a long time, but that's really my personal passion. We need to reverse the paradigm, the current paradigms of push to pull, which was the initial intent how Tim Berners-Lee and others envision the web. But so from an investor's perspective, that provides just an almost unlimited amount of investment opportunities. And more importantly, it addresses the largest technology debt. If you just look at banking, finance, legal, government, all of those um, carry technology debt that blockchain-based solutions can address. Yeah, that makes perfect sense. Um, so you know, obviously, you're a technology investor, um, and a lot has changed in the blockchain space since we last spoke. Um, you know, what are some emerging trends, and what do you think, more specifically, are the most important topics in the blockchain space? Yeah. So, as an investor, we're obviously trying to somewhat predict the future, right? For us and for any investor, it's all about timing. When you get in, when you get out, and so. Partially that's pattern recognition, but then partially it's also just making basic observations. And there's some useful paradigms such as the Gartner cycle that you can use that lends itself to some good observations. And in this particular case, it fits, fits pretty well with like starting from the invention of Bitcoin in 2008 and then the launch of the network in 2009. And then you, you see some of those adjacent um, companies develop, like the Bitmans of the world, the Coinbases of the world. I would call them blockchain adjacent, right? They, they don't necessarily run blockchains. So they provide the infrastructure and or liquidation events in this particular case. But then we ran into the cycle of, uh, let's call it inflated, expectations, the ICO phases that everybody in the space obviously knows. And then shortly after we went through like this trough of disillusionment. And now we are roughly in a time where there's more enlightenment, where there's actually some of the protocols initially were proposed finally launching. And so the most important inflection points that we predict for the future is um, two things. A, the, the largest part that's missing is um, flexible on and off ramps, the typical, I have to buy ether first because I can, before I can run anything useful on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, and then secondly, the infrastructure plays as in decentralized storage, decentralized bandwidth and so forth. So from that perspective, the most important thing you're going to see most likely with inside the next five years, the central bank digital currencies that promise um, to provide first of all digital cash, which the interesting part is we actually never achieved that, right? If you look at the Bitcoin white paper, that's what it was asking for, but we still don't have that, right? Uh, it still doesn't exist. And so CBDCs could, and in my opinion, will actually provide this. And then the, the other large part is identity. We need to have useful identity solution, albeit I call it a little more nuanced because oftentimes people use this somewhat misguided term digital identity which is really something that belongs in the realm of transhumanism and people that work on consciousness on digital in the digital realm but the larger part here is that for anything that is value transfer that's not as simple as just money you need to actually associate this to an individual and or entity so in as long as you're using legacy database technologies you're back to square one Right, so you're still ending up with legacy regulation and data silos, and that's exactly what we we're trying to fix. We're trying to provide peer-to-peer -peer value transfer at the end of the day, and for that to happen, you need to have something that typically people refer to as self-sovereign identity. I would refer to this as self-sovereign agency, right? Something where I can manipulate my data, I can manipulate my assets without the help of an intermediary, without the help of a custodian. Wow, that's amazing. There's a lot there yeah. that, that's fascinating. Yeah, it's a very, very big topic. I think, uh, you know, a lot of things come up right there. You know, um, 
I, I try not to get into politics on this show, but in America, this this last election has brought a lot of problems in regards to our voting system. And I've always wondered since we started this podcast in 2016, can we do voting on the blockchain? You know, we can do everything else on the internet, but why can't we do voting? And there's the issue of identity. And have you seen any promising uh, developments in that direction? Or is that just, are we better off with paper? Oh, no, that's actually funny because incidentally, we yes, yesterday touched base with a voting project on the blockchain that we've been monitoring for some time and it's starting to get some traction. Okay. And so if, you're, if you saw Brock Pierce, he, he um, actually was promoting this to, to some degree in his presidential run. So, yeah, we, we think this is something that will happen. It's just a matter of time and who is going to deliver this. But But you're absolutely right. It's... 100% dependent on identity. So I'm also a board member of the standards organization within the travel space for that particular reason. Because if you're traveling, you need to have an interchange of data with other countries, right? So you need to um, pass on passport information, including things that people never have heard of that come with, uh, with identifying people. Uh, i.e. If, if you have a name that's similar to, to that of someone who's on the no-fly list, there, there are exemption codes that the, that Homeland dis, um, Security in, in our uh, country here disperses uh, to these people that are then transmitted in a particular way and so forth. So we made a few investments um, that are mostly on uh, the what I would call onboarding of identity or onboarding of agency is concerned. So for the time being, that's the whole biometric space. But then long term, I think you, you'll see very, very sophisticated uh, layered solutions in that space. And that comes down to the fact that a lot of solutions that we're working on are essentially legal solutions, right? So they need to not only identify who you are, which is uh, what a lot of these systems unfortunately like, hone in on and then re disregard anything else, like the, the whole DID topic that's mostly about identification. Um, but you got many, many layers if you understand legal technologies. You got authentication, you got verifications. Um, then in, in the representation area, you got personas, you got avatars, you got profiles. You need to actually learn the language of that space. And unfortunately, for most people, it includes learning that legal language. And because before you understand that terminology, like in, in the, on the semantic level, every day in talking level, um, you can't actually code it, right? It's, it's impossible for you to code anything that's going to work long time and serve this, this particular purpose. Yeah, I think there's just as much uh, words in the legalese dictionary as there are in the English dictionary. Yes. So it's... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ma ma many more because it, it, it's always contextual, right? And uh, I have another useless degree in classical literature and that's even more complex. Wow, that's excellent. I... Um... Hope to read the classics one day, but it's never the same if if I could just learn the languages that they were written in because there's so much lost in translation. Oh yeah, no, I mean if you want to talk about that a little bit, if if you read classical literature, you you will have to read several books in parallel because you have to understand what was going on at the time. And most of these guys, they they were also polymath, right? So they were also into natural sciences. So they were, they were studying. Um, astronomy, they were studying biology and so forth, and they, uh, you will find this in their writing. You gotta understand the metaphors that a plant in, in a scene uh, provides, right? As an example. Anyway, so uh, that makes it way more interesting. It's kind of like with any other art, if you understand like the different techniques that are being used to produce certain results, you have the higher appreciation for it, right? And uh, to, to some extent, and maybe I'm bending it here, um, that translates to technology and, and legal language as well, right? You have a larger appreciation if you spend some time working in the legal field and um, in, in Europe and Germany specifically, the education is somewhat different. You're becoming a representative of the laws, so of the law school, you actually have to work for a judge, you work for a state prosecutor, you work for a local community. So you get more like a 360 degree um, view of how the law works because 
Um, here, you get more an adversarial system by here. I mean, the United States, where a, um, a lawyer is typically a representative of the client, where in Germany specifically, the lawyer is a representative of the law, right? And so there's there's reasons, obviously, for certain regulations and laws to exist, and you want to first and foremost understand those reasons, right? And that's the most important aspect, and that's where I see the largest disconnect and have been seen for five years now in this space. But unfortunately, a lot of Lawyers don't explain what is the reason for a certain law, but simply um, explain to certain startups that their technology or they specifically should be complying with this. That is actually, in, in a way, very wrong, right? Because uh, my partner coined a really good phrase after he heard me talk about this uh, a few times. He was saying something to the extent, well, um, uh, regulation will not disrupt blockchain. Blockchain will disrupt regulation. Because blockchain is actually an awesome tool to provide a lot of these objectives that re regulation sets, sets forth, right? So banking compliance alone costs $275 billion a year. So th that's money that they have to make back from their clients first before they can make any profit. So we are paying for that, right? We are paying for these inefficiencies. But needless to say, uh, blockchain-based solution, or I think the, the term decentralized software solution is actually more accurate because it includes graph solutions, um, can provide a lot of these functions because a lot of these functions have to do with transparency, have to do with custody, have to do um, with just being able to prove certain things that um, you cannot do in database silos-based systems, right? Yeah, very good. I think that you've got a very excellent background for what you're doing so they're they're lucky to have you there and some of our listeners may know a little bit about small time investing you know maybe they're into cryptocurrency and they might know a little bit about timing and if you if you time it right you could make a lot of money if you have bad timing you could lose a lot of money but in regard to investing in the blockchain space how do you think about timing and how do, how does that kind of relate yeah so if if you go back to the original demand or the original battle cry of, of Bitcoin with by peer to peer cash, we, as I mentioned, we still haven't done this yet. So it, it's important to, to focus on that because um, I, I've been making, I, I, I think, a lot of enemies with um, the statement that I think that the number of cryptocurrencies we need is potentially somewhere between zero and one. Because in essence, they're all middleware, <laughs> if you think about it. But the larger point here being is as an investor, what we could observe is that there are certain companies that um, aggregate a lot of value. So the Bitmains and Coinbases of the world are now worth 10 billion or 14.5 million, respectively, based on their last rounds. And so they're all blockchain adjacent. But then moving forward, what you'll see um, to get to mass adoption we need to have the interfaces to work with that, right? Because cryptocurrency adoption, and that's a battle cry that you still hear every day, is kind of backwards, right? People did not adopt voice of IP. They adopted Skype, right? So if you ask your mom if she ever uses voice of IP, she probably tells you I have no idea what that is, and I probably don't. But then you point out that she's using WhatsApp or something else, and you'll say, well, mom, that's voice of IP. And Mom obviously doesn't care and shouldn't care. So the best technology is those that you don't have to understand. And the biggest fallacy here is, is around that topic of money. And I've been ranting against that for the longest time because the worst thing you can do as a technologist is invent a new language for people to adopt your new technology. So uh, the constant idea of... I. I'm, I'm developing a new currency as in I'm developing a new unit of account. It's the worst thing you can do for your, the adoption of your particular language. And that's why if you're opening up any um, trading app, any wallet, what do you see? You see your Bitcoin holdings, you see your Ether holdings, you see your XRP if you're misguided. And you see a translation into the unit of account that you have been indoctrinated in. So for you, that might be British pound sterling. For me, that might be US dollar. And for someone in Germany, it might be the euro. The unit of account is the remaining function of money, is the remaining function of currency. Because the medium of exchange has been bytes for decades for all of these systems. Right? It doesn't matter if you're exchanging 
um, a euro, a dollar, or a Bitcoin, you're essentially using bytes to exchange them. The difference here is, and that's the important part to point out, is typically digital money in, in the past, the fiat money, is held in databases, and these databases are controlled by banks. Right? So that is the main difference. It's, it's not uh, the different um, in medium of exchange. That's the same. And if you're inventing a new unit of account, you will have to translate it for people to understand, right? Yeah. And, and you said something earlier that I, uh, I, I think I agree with that we haven't quite gotten to the digital cash peer-to-peer -peer, uh, that was talked about in the Satoshi white paper. Um, others might disagree, but um, what would you say to those people? And, and what would it take for us to have that... Uh, you know, internet cash? Well, so I think of Bitcoin as money of last resort. So it, money is a network technology, right? It, it becomes more valuable the more people actually have it and use it. And the typical example for this I always make is if you have all the money in the world, it's worth nothing because no one else has it, right? So that's pretty easy to understand. So from that perspective, if you're looking at this globally, what is the dominating language of value? It's the US dollar. So you can pay with the US dollars in many countries around the world. They, they won't bat an eye, they will accept it as, um, as value, right? And so that is the main, function, uh, the, the main function of money today. It's just your language of value. So what you have to understand is that, that the old definition that people have been indoctrinated in and that you will find in all discussion papers around this topic has always been wrong. What I mean by that is so typically what you will find is Javon's um, definition of money from 1875, which claims that uh, the functions of money are a unit of account, a medium of exchange, and a store of value. Well, that describes commodity money. So that describes precious metal money, right? But it has, um, that was never a relevant medium of exchange and large, uh, large scale system to transfer value. Large scale systems to transfer value were always ledgers. Initially, they were simply what I call wetware ledgers, as in uh, we just kept this in our heads, like I, I gave this person something, I want something back, which by the way is still today the case. And then we moved it to paper ledgers and started writing this down and before that we may, might make some carvings in, in, in stones and woods. And then eventually in the 60s, we introduced databases. And then unfortunately what happened is we connected all of these databases to networks and um, that is a big problem. But the larger point here being is you, you gotta realize that there's only two functions to money specifically. And the main function of money is that of lending. And this is how most money is born. A secondary function is that of spending, so payments. But that's a secondary function. The larger use case by far is that of lending. And you can observe this everywhere. And so I like to think of this in first principles. It's like, if you look at the stages of money, how is money being created? How is it being stored? How is it being moved? And then potentially also how is, how is being removed? And so right now, how we are creating money is typically through commercial banks, right? So the largest a source of money that um, ends up being base money is simply lending for um, for mortgages, right? And then you've got other buckets like uh, for, for commercial activity, you've got lending for education and you've got lending for, for spending and things like um, order loans and so forth. So those are the largest buckets, how money is being created. And the, the after it's being created, it's being stored in databases right now. And uh, uh, the guidance and under control of commercial banks. So that's why also all of these discussions around topics of inflation are not nuanced enough. All the, all the discussions around the topic of money are never nuanced enough because in and of itself, inflation is not, not a bad thing, right? And for, it depends on where is my, my ledger entry, <laughs> if that's a bad thing for me specifically or if it's a good thing for me, right? So it's very, very nuanced. And the same holds true for money. There, there's no general statements. So most of the time when people talk about inflation, they talk about overall money supply, and then they refer to the Federal Reserve's printing of money. Uh, that is by far the, the smallest amount of how money is being created today. It has been for, for a very long time. So it's, it's sort of a red herring, but 
Uh, the point here being, though, is if you look at money qualification and quantification, so there's a typical classification that calls like physical cash M0 and then uh, M1 being uh, demand deposits. So you can think of this as your checking account. And then you got uh, all other classes being M2 and so forth up to broad money. And broad money is the overall money supply. So the larger point being is as a technologist, what, what you want to derive at is you want to take bad money. Um, uh, uh, well, th there's this, this law, Gresham's law, called, um, which is called that you that bad money will drive good money out of circulation. So if, if you have something that's inflationary, you want to get rid of this, right? So that's the spending function. But the larger point here being is if you don't have to hold on to it in the first place, you're better off. So the point here being is if and when we get to a, a place to where you only have to take out um, a store of value for payment at the second that someone is asking for that, that's what you would do, right? So you, uh, the simple example for that is you don't keep a million dollars in your checking account usually, right? You keep as much in your checking account as you expect to spend in a certain time horizon. But if the technology facilitates that, and that's really the battle cry that you should focus on, if the technology facilitates that, then you only want to move this um, instrument into a payment function if and when someone's asking for that on the other end. So that is then peer-to-peer -peer cash because that actually then facilitates what's technically possible already, right? Well, buy it's technically move at the speed of light but they practically don't because I've been stored in databases. So that's the nuance that people need to understand. That, that's the advantage that blockchain-based solutions um, can provide. And it, it's not being accomplished by creating a new unit of account. A new unit of account creates a whole host of complications. I'm just gonna mention one and then I, I stop talking about that because I typically give one hour lectures just on the topic of money, but the, the obvious point is we just had the announcement that PayPal now provides um, access to uh, Bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies. Well, that is a terrible idea to use that for, for payments, right? It's a terrible idea. Can you imagine you, you just spend cryptocurrency to buy your coffee? And so uh, a year from now, you have to explain to your accountant what was the cost basis for your Bitcoin <laughs> for this $4.50 coffee. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> because you just created a taxable event, and that's just w one of the many difficulties and, and problems you're gonna create. But the the larger part is simply um, spending is is not an interesting function to solve, right? Spending has been solved many times over. I have 15 different ways to to do spending on my phone already, and that's true for most developed nations. And if you are in a developing nation, you will still, as a default medium of exchange um, turn to the printed version of physical cash. And we've seen this throughout history, right? Um, whenever a local currency failed due to hyperinflation, they literally imported physical US dollars into the country and used that as the medium of exchange and unit of account at this point in time, right? And that's why actually uh, physical cash are, uh, printed in the United States, more than 50% of it is actually outside of the United States. It's the most successful export program. Wow. That's fascinating. This the topic of money is just something that um, continually amazes me. And it's, you know, it's a, it's a man-made creation when it really comes down to it. And it's kind of amazing the amount of um, progress we've made since, you know, the gold vault days in Europe to, to now. Um, and I, uh, yeah, I really agree with, with everything you're saying and this, this uh, expert uh, per perception that you have there. I think that, you know, I don't know if we could have gotten to where we are today without all of the banking regulation. And you just on the topic of regulation, you said something earlier that was really interesting about how the blockchain space will change regulation instead of the other way around. And I've heard a lot of similar um, statements because the technology moves so fast. Sometimes it's hard for governments to keep up. Um, do you do you think that's the case? And and um, you know, how do you think about the impact of regulation in the blockchain space? Yeah, and yeah, I touched on that earlier. I think the discussion has been really um, 
the reverse way it should be. So really what needs to happen is that um, legal professionals need to explain to technologists what is the objective of the law and then build this into the technology. So as an investor, we don't want to hand over a million dollars and see this go to compliance costs, to legal consulting costs. We, we, we are technology investors. We want to see this to going towards technology being built. And there's an unlimited amount of technologies that can and will be built within that space. So the, the current unfortunate um, coronavirus scenario has put a lot of pressure on government to be more efficient. And so we're involved in limited capacity in some of those um, movements to where uh, governments now more actively are looking to adopt blockchain-based solutions, decentralized software solutions in particular, A, for the distribution of things such as subsidies and here in California specifically food stamps. There's, I forgot the actual number. I think there's more than 10 million people on, on food stamps. And sometimes you've, you've seen this very, very recently if um, these people need to um, get aid and they are unbanked, which, oh, that's the number 10 million. There's 10 million unbanked in the US alone. And so those people need to get checks. And not only does it cost $3 for the government, so it's coming out of their money to produce these checks and distribute them, but then also these people in many cases have to wait for these checks for weeks. Um, so, but the larger point there is, I, I think, so that's one of the positive offshoots of these scenarios. It, it has, re has really exposed to, um, on one end, the, the technology debt that specifically government, but also banks uh, incurred. There's been some reports that I think was something like 40 some percent of banks still had databases that used COBOL. It's some, in some capacity, which is uh, the first database that was ever developed in the 1960s was COBOL based. And all, that's also true for um, big government agencies such as social security services here. And these are simply not capable of providing the speed that we need to get aid to people in this particular thing. And the other thing that we touched on was voting. In my opinion, voting absolutely needs to be on the blockchain. And the, the thing that's necessary connected to that is the whole topic of agency and identity. And there we already see uh, pilot projects from Homeland Security and so forth that issue credentialing and authentication documents on a blockchain-based solution. And that's inevitable because if you think about this, um, databases are inherently insecure, right? So if you call up uh, your credit card company, what happens? There's some person in a typically low-wage country looking at all of your personal data, has access to all of that, and that data is a lot worth a lot of money in a certain scenarios. So if he, she grabs a snapshot of that particular entry, uh, he, she can then um, make money of it, selling that later that equates to a, a day's salary. So that is not a really great mechanism to store data and is a really bad incentive mechanism at the same point in time. So certain data should have never been entered in databases. Unfortunately, um, that was the only technology available at the time. But now we have better technologies. And I don't think necessarily that these will be blockchain-based solutions. They will most likely be graph-based solutions using cryptographic primitives, specifically for PID, so personal identifiable data and or assets. Um, but it's, it's a large step up regardless of what you're doing, right? Yeah. Yeah, that's, that's very interesting. Um, I saw something in... Uh, I don't remember which news article it was, but there's legislation in, I think in the, the Senate or maybe in the House about anti-encryption laws. Have you heard anything about that? Oh yeah, that's not going to pass. <laughs> okay. Well, that makes me feel a little better. Yeah. I mean, they, they name it something that makes it seem like it's a good thing, kind of like the Patriot Act, but when it comes down to it, it's maybe they're solving one problem. I think it was like child trafficking or, or, or something like that, the Child Protection Act, I can't remember, which is good, sounds good, but all of the other encrypted services that people use would, you know, they would have a back door to it. So, um, yeah, I haven't, yeah, I'm sorry, go ahead. It's not, it's not tenable, right? Because, um, I mean, te technology can't be uninvented. 
right? So it's gonna happen, it is happening, and it doesn't matter how many regulations you're gonna pass, because we need this type of security on an individual basis, not on a government basis. And if you think about this, if you really wanted to um, go after illicit activity, you would simply outlaw cash, right? That is the number one instrument that um, criminals use to do their commercial activities. When they raided Saddam Hussein's palace, they found $300 million in cash <laughs> in the palace. Because at the end of the day, uh, when it comes down to it, that is the most useful instrument. And they are specifically $100 notes, right? But um, so it, it's somewhat hypocritical to, to focus on aspects where you can actually avoid these things altogether. Because at the end of the day, it's important to understand that regulation doesn't address technology. Regulation addresses people. It's responsible uh, parties. It's citizens, typically, right, that are being addressed, either legal entities or individuals that, that fall under this. Uh, technology is regulated by code, right? So I subscribe very much to that idea that code is law. And you can audit code. And uh, if you don't like the code, don't use it, right? <laughs> yeah, that's good. I like that. Um, I'm kind of curious what your sort of core criteria would be for making investments. And, you know, specifically we're talking about, you know, the blockchain solution area. Do you, do you have any that you'd be willing to share with us? Sure. Yeah. I, th I think I touched on this earlier. We're very scientifically minded. And we're, we're, so we actually sit down and we write thesis papers and some of them you will find online. I will typically share something on Forbes or Hacker Noon every couple of weeks and um, a lot of these papers touch on our thesis for the space. And you start writing a thesis by simply observing the current state of something. And in our case, that something is the state of technology and in particular areas that we're interested in investing in. So, so mostly the movement of value and um, that, that includes identity as, as a topic. So we sit down, we write these thesis papers and then Essentially, our due diligence process when we engage with startup is that of a peer review. Ideally, I learned something in, in the process because if you're building a new technology, then you should formulate your problem and you should tell me how you're solving it and how you derive at it. And uh, your competition is basically other experiments that you should be pointing out and why they are failing, right? And so we get then the benefit of being able to aggregate all of those. And so... That's how I, I look at the space of investing. I look at this from a very scientific perspective. We have a thesis on how things are playing out within our investment horizon, which is five to 10 years. So we have a fairly long-term horizon. We're not speculators, obviously. And then we're trying to uh, prognosticize um, what a particular technology can achieve within this particular space. So, and, and usually I refer to this within a particular realm as the BTAM, the total blockchain addressable market. Right? So, and uh, I'll just mention one that uh, I, I typically use as an example is, is with, uh, within the realm of payment. So initially we looked at a lot of payments and also a lot of um, remittance startups. And then we eventually came to the conclusion that the future alpha in those spaces is zero. So what I mean by that, payments as an example right now is a $2 trillion industry, as in there's $2 trillion worth of revenue being generated for companies within that space and 30% of all revenue of um, commercial bank is being derived from payments. But if you look at current technologies, right, so it comes back to observation, uh, the best technology, funny enough, is your physical cash in that sense for payments, right? So I give it to you, I don't have it anymore. You didn't need to see my passport. You didn't need to know my name. And by just simply giving it to you, the transaction is settled. There's finality there. And there were no fees attached. So if and when we achieve that, uh, well, then the alpha from payment itself is zero, right? So moving forward, in order to create returns for an investor, you need to propose something else that people and businesses are valuing are willing to pay you for because otherwise there's no alpha to be had. So from that perspective, the current alpha, and um, there's, there's this Bezos quote, uh, which I typically translate to as like, your, your um, profits is my opportunity, right? Um, so I look at all of these profits in that space as an opportunity for startups we invest in to 
um, acquire customers. All right, so that's, that's uh, the, the resemblance of their customer acquisition cost. If I provide a payment function to you for free, but I provide you this additional feature, let's say analytic, let's say a loyalty program that I charge you a flat fee for months for, then that will make me want to change. Because for any change to occur, we typically have this rule of thumb that you need to have three things. It needs to be cheaper, it needs to be faster, and it needs to be better in some way. And the better in some way is often what people fail to express, to work on and build a business model around. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And um, just to kind of expand on that, if there's any startups listening right now, do you have any any recommendations for them that that are trying that might want to raise money from your fund or uh yeah and i actually put this down into a hacker article that you probably should put in the show notes so or you can kind of um summarize that let i think i made a note here so i don't forget any any point so um first of all you should always start and that is not limited to venture capital but you always should start with researching your audience right so in, in the particular case of an investor you want to figure out okay what are the stages they invest in what are the topics they invest in i get quite a bit of um emails with people that are trying to get me to invest into like real estate related things and uh, a quick glance on my profile on, on linkedin would tell you well that's not the sort of thing we like to invest in we invest in very specific technologies right and then uh, for the past couple of years we've been focused on, on a seed and series A stages and moving forward we'll expand that but that was our focus thus far and then some of my pet pieces and I probably get an email of that once a week is don't ask us for an NDA we see 100 projects every month and so uh, I would have to hire someone just to keep track of all of our NDAs plus we probably have seen a similar solution before because of our of our focus is so narrowly narrow. So we probably know more about your field that, that you um, focus on than you typically. And then, as a as a there's a um, rule of thumb: if you ask for money, you typically get advice. If you ask for advice, you might get money. That's um, good. But then, secondly, and that that should be self evident. Explain how you create. Uh, a return of investment for us, right? So if, if we give you a million dollars, um, our expectation, depending on the stage of the investment, is a certain multiple, right? So explain how you achieve that multiple. If you think that your company is worth five or $10 million today, so explain how you make it worth 50 or $100 million within a certain time frame, And that should be self-evident, but um, more often than not, we don't see that. And there's a lot of homework you should be doing anyway before you write the, your first line of code in our case. So figure out what is the total addressable market. And we, we touched on that earlier. This is somewhat um, more difficult in this particular uh, um, technology that we are investing in because it's so disruptive, right? So it will disrupt certain um, revenue flows entirely. So you need to come up at least with a thesis on how you're gonna um, create alpha in the future and what is the total addressable market in the future. If the total addressable market for payments today is um, $2 trillion a year, then how are you gonna benefit from that? What, how you slash it down and how you're gonna make uh, this a total addressable market in the future in five years from now when uh, we expect to see some return or maybe it's 10 years. But the larger point here being is I have seen I don't know how many, probably a hundred slides or more. Well, they present something as a TAM. Let's say they, they want to sell something that is a blockchain-based real estate solution. Um, they will claim that the total addressable market of, uh, uh, is the value of all real estate. Um, it's self-evident that's not that this is incorrect, right? The, the total addressable market is how much you can charge your particular clients for your particular software, not the value of all real estate. So. You need to start segmenting it from there and then just do your homework, get us all the other KPIs. We're data driven and most venture funds are if they, uh, if they uh, have so sound investment criteria. So figure out your KPIs. What's your customer acquisition cost? What's the lifetime value? And then figure this into your business model, right? 
And you should do this anyway, regardless if you're pitching an investor or if you're hoping to do this out of your own funds, right? You, you should have at least a thesis on that. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm saying it's necessary homework before you start building anything. So then uh, if it's somewhat of a later stage, if you're looking for a series A and not just seed funding, show us some indication of product market fit, right? So show us that people want to use your solution in any capacity. And then most importantly, what problem are you solving? And that's a, a, there's a big confusion within our particular realm. A lot of times people will pitch us a problem to a technology or a, a solution to a technology problem. What you want to fix is a people problem. So a, a, pro, a problem that people experience because yes, there are many technology problems, but if I don't experience that on a daily basis, like payment is not a problem for me, right? So I have a wallet that has a credit card, a debit card, I have a phone that, that has already multiple ways of paying. Payment is not a problem for me. Um, to merchant, there might, there might be a problem attached to that uh, that manifests itself in merchant account fees and so forth. So they might be your client, but uh, don't pitch me on the idea that I have a problem paying for things. I don't. Uh, I have many different ways of doing that. And for me, it also seems to be seamless and instant, even though it's not, right? I, I don't experience the fact that it doesn't settle instantly, right? Like ACH sends actions settle on average within 90 days. It's, it's <laughs> from a technology perspective, it's a big, big problem and it's sort of nonsensical. And also if you have the merchant waiting for that money, that's, that's also a problem, but it's not a problem that the consumer experiences ever. So uh, if you're addressing the consumer with that idea that you're solving this payment problem, the consumer is probably gonna, for the most part, check his head and think, I don't have a problem paying. <laughs> I've been paying just fine for decades. <laughs> And you can observe how people are doing this right now, right? And the, the other part to, uh, on that particular end is also the idea of we're onboarding uh, the unbanked to these particular systems, right? That's a very nuanced problem in and of itself that you need to understand. And that also plays into the realm of the uh, of remittance. It's, it's very fragmented as in half of the 1.7 billion people that are unbanked, they're unbanked because they don't have any government issued credentials. And so for, for them to to do through a KYC procedure and buy cryptocurrencies from a centralized exchange is as impossible as it is to create a bank account. So no no difference for them in that case. And the other part is that they simply live in a cash based society, right? So they they might not have internet access, and the other party is asking actually asking for checks. So that's a that's half of the remittance space where these individuals are living in a cash-based society. So your cryptocurrency solution for the most part doesn't do them any good, right? There, there's no network effects to be had. So there's a lot of hard work to be done if you want to create those, but probably by the time you create those network effects, we have centralized digital currencies and your solution is, is irrelevant. Anyway, so I, I dove down in one particular rabbit hole because that's something I've seen a few hundred times over the past five years, uh, but then Lastly, um, have a fundraising strategy. So often what I see also, at least every other week is that um, startup will ask for a certain amount that represents, let's call it 30 or 50% of, of the capital, of the capital base. Well, uh, what are you gonna do for later rounds, right? So uh, we don't, as an investor, wanna see uh, yourself being diluted uh, to less than 50% of your capital because the incentives uh, won't be very aligned anymore. <laughs> anyway, so have a strategy for that and there's good examples to be had. So you, you're just coming across as someone who hasn't done their homework if you're in your first round are, uh, are offering to sell a third or 50% of the capital base. <laughs> Yeah, so those are kind of some some highlights, and, and to me, again, we, we've been doing this for for twenty years. They seem self evident at this point in time, but that's why I just fairly recently, I think, at the beginning of the year, uh, published this article just summarizing those because uh, I just come across um, these issues on a weekly basis still. Yeah, and you you do excellent writing. Um... You know, for those listening, where can they go? Uh, I'll definitely include it in the show notes, but um, if they're just maybe driving in their car, where, where can they go to connect with you? Yeah, if you, if you just Google my last name and add Forbes to it, you'll find 
um, my Forbes portfolio where I, I published something every other month or so, I just uh, submitted something that speaks to our macro thesis, but then also a couple in the past that speak to cryptocurrencies and NFTs and like very nuanced thesis on how we think about things. And then what I do as a matter of principle, I republish those because on Forbes, I can't republish it. Like, I can't edit it. And as I mentioned, we are scientifically minded. So the main reason for me and us to publish this is to for peer review, right? I don't need kudos. I don't. I don't need likes. I, uh, if I see something incorrect and you have better data than me, uh, I, I would love for you to email me and let me know here. This is what you didn't see and this is what you didn't consider, right? That that is the main intention of doing this. So uh, and so, if and when I get this type of peer review, I actually edit it where I can. So um, we have a really good relationship with Hacker Noon, which is. Uh, a really good uh, online publication that we tech focused. And so I republish those in a longer form because on Forbes are also limited to a thousand words. So I typically publish a two, three thousand um, word version there and then expand on this. And then at the bottom, you will always see my disclaimer hey, whatever you're reading now, it might, might change if I get smarter in the meantime. And by the next time <laughs> you read this, there might be additions to that. Right? In my mind, this is just intellectual honesty demands that you you change your mind when the facts change right yeah that's a good sign we need more minds like yours <laughs> so well uh christian i really appreciate your time with me today i know that we've kind of ran past our time here but um if you um if you'd like to give us any closing thoughts or the website where people can can go to learn more yeah i mean as, as venture fund we don't put a lot of like information on on our website itself, uh, okay. and so most of the things that we share, we share uh, as articles, and they they speak to our thinking on the space. And so the only quote unquote social media outlet I use at uh, the somewhat frequent basis is, is LinkedIn, and then every now and then I'll will tweet something, but then typically that just re refers back to the things that we just published that we would like to get some reviews for they're good danke schön i uh man this has been a really good talk it's it's a real pleasure to have you back on the show um i wish you all the best and um for anybody listening please check out the show notes to uh, to read more of, of christian's articles you will not be disappointed and um i just want to thank you again for your time and yeah have a good rest of your day thank you, you too. talk to you soon